Hiya gang, I'm my radar meteorologist Matt Capucci with a tropical weather update. We're seven weeks into hurricane season and we've already had five storms in the Atlantic. One of them was actually an unnamed subtropical storm that the National Hurricane Center totally missed back in January. It met all the requirements of a subtropical storm. For starters, it was an isolated warm core-ish swirl of thunderstorms in the middle of a larger mid-latitude low. If you look closely, you can just barely see an eye developing. So what do we mean by warm core? Well, basically, it was deriving some energy from the warm ocean waters of the Gulf Stream below compared to a mid-latitude cyclone, which would extract energy only from air temperature clashes and the jet stream above. This chart might look confusing, but just focus on the indicators over the red and purple corresponding to warm core. It also met the requirements of having shed its fronts, getting rid of the cold front, the warm front, it was just its own self-contained blob. Now satellites passing over it also ascertained winds over the 40 mile per hour naming threshold. This data is from a scatterometer or an instrument on board a polar orbiting satellite that measures wind speed by looking at how churned up and rough the sea surface below is. The wavier the waves are, well, I guess all waves are wavy, but the angrier the seas are, the stronger the winds probably are. Even more convincing is this microwave imagery under the hood. We can see an eyewall-like feature. Now at the time, the National Hurricane Center did include it in their outlooks, but they said it was quote, unlikely to develop. Here's a look at what lots of meteorologists argued should have been named Arlene. Classic subtropical structure in the middle of a broader mid-latitude low. It happens. It's just if a, if a piece of a storm can get stuck over uh, water for a, piece of, for a period of time, yeah, it happens. And here's that same exact setup back in October 1991 with the so-called perfect storm. It should have been named Hurricane Grace. The National Hurricane Center announced in May that they had revisited the data and concluded the system was indeed a subtropical storm. It couldn't retroactively have been named or earned the name Arlene, so it's just kind of this nameless thing. Maximum sustained winds made it to 70 miles per hour, making it the strongest storm of the season to date. It eventually made landfall in Nova Scotia on January 17th. So now what's next for hurricane season? Well, early season forecasts called for well below average activity. We initially believed a nascent El Nino would squash some of the Atlantic's hurricane risk, which would have been great. El Nino begins as a warming of water temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific. Usually, we switch back and forth between El Nino and La Nina every couple years. In this plot, red is El Nino and blue is La Nina. La Nina is a cooler phase of the ocean. All indications are that El Nino will continue to strengthen into the late summer and fall as we approach peak hurricane season. So why does El Nino work against storms? Well, it amplifies wind shear or a disruptive change of wind speed and or direction with height. That can play a game of tug of war with storms and knock them off kilter, like this one here, where the thunderstorms were literally pushed east of the low level swirl. Storms like that just can't really intensify. El Nino also has an influence on the Whopper circulation, an overturning circulation in the global tropics. The warm Pacific waters heat the air from below, causing rising. But what goes up must come down somewhere else, and so we get sinking air or subsidence over the Atlantic. That works to suppress tropical activity. But now we're suddenly expecting an above average season, so what gives? We know that sea surface temperatures basically over the entire Atlantic Basin are above normal, so this is not terribly surprising. What was surprising was that African easterly waves, those spun up a little bit more quickly than we thought they were going to. So you just need something coherent out there over warm SSTs and you'll get development. And that's what, we, that's what happened. Well, look at the Atlantic. It's just downright red hot. That's high octane fuel for a hurricane, assuming one can form and take advantage of it. The Gulf is so darn hot that we're unfortunately anticipating major coral reef bleaching. And as a whole, the Atlantic is literally off the charts. We're more than 2.3 degrees above average and roughly a degree above the previous record, which is a huge margin to beat a record by. That should make for more powerful storms and more than offset the effects of El Nino. But because the sea surface temperatures are so warm, that usually generates a lot of near, uh, near coastal storms. You have to really watch the Gulf of Mexico. That really becomes a hot spot. That's why Colorado State University is now calling for a busy season. They expect 18 named storms, nine hurricanes, and four major hurricanes. They also estimate a 50-50 shot that a major hurricane strikes the United States coastline, which is all the more reason for everyone to be prepared long before a storm actually develops. And this is a, a serious hazard because you're you know, when you when you have a storm that's three to five days out, you, the you know National Hurricane Center they're great at their job, so you're going to get some really good warning notifications. If something spins up and develops near land, you have reduced those time frames, right? Like we saw that with Ian, that they made it made that dive, then all of a sudden three to five days became 24 hours, and that's a really big problem from a safety perspective. So why is the Atlantic so warm to begin with? Well, it has to do with the Bermuda High. 
We also sometimes call it the Azores High. It's basically a, a semi-stagnant high that sits over the open Atlantic and spins clockwise. This map, however, shows the strength of pressure systems compared to normal. Look where the Bermuda High should be in white. It's way weaker than normal this season. That in turn weakened the flow around it, reduced the clockwise spinning flow, and weakened the easterly trade winds that blow across the tropical Atlantic. See if you can spot those easterly winds amid the Atlantic's general circulation. So you cut back the winds, you cut back on mixing, or the churning up of cooler waters from below. That left the surface seawater unperturbed and able to soak up all the sunshine and just roast. So altogether, we're expecting a near to above average hurricane season. Admittedly, I'm a little bit concerned about steering currents. Right now, we have a jet stream dip over the eastern US. Remember, highs are like force fields fending off the storms, but troughs or jet stream dips are weaknesses in that force field. That could allow storms to come ominously close to the eastern U.S. if the pattern holds. What we have to watch for at the end of the season, and it can happen anytime, but usually at the end of the season is when a frontal system makes it in and leaves a piece of vorticity, a piece of uh, rotating wind behind. Those can generate, under, it undergoes a process called tropical transition. So that's another pathway you have to watch. It's just that with the shear, the long trackers from, you know, like I said, Africa to the Gulf Coast, those are a little tougher to get. Regardless of whatever this season brings, we've got you covered every step of the way. Keep a tune to My Radar on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and right here in the My Radar app. And just remember, it only ever takes one storm. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android. Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.